Good morning and uh, welcome to day three of EU Pollinator Week 2021. This session, which has as its theme advancing environmental risk assessment for bees and other insect pollinators, is brought to you by the European Food Safety Authority with support from the European Chemicals Agency and Bee Life European Beekeeping Coordination. I'm Steve Pagani from EFSA and I'm your moderator for this session. Uh, before we start with the presentations, I have the pleasure of introducing our chair, member of the European Parliament, Jutta Paulus, who will deliver her opening remarks. And before she does that, can people put their videos off? Except Madame Paulus, of course. <laughs> so, um, Peter Ockerman and Mr. Afik, can you put your video off, please? Okay, well, that's fine. Uh, over to you, Ms. Paulus. Yeah, thank you, Steve, for the introduction and thanks for having me here today. As scientist, I ran my own lab working on pesticide um, authorization and reach. I'm always very happy to get a bit nerdy and discuss technicalities with fellow scientists. Um, but before we go into the scientific part, I would like to give some context about the whole debate. Um, as Greens, we have always been very active on this topic for more than 10 years now. And the rapporteur for the last revision of the pesticides regulation, which led to the adoption in 2009, was actually a member of the Greens, Hitchwood Bayer. Um, it was upon our initiative that the Parliament strengthened the approval criteria by requiring the active substance, that the active substance in pesticides shall not be approved if it has an an acceptable chronic effect on honeybees. That's also why we objected to the modification of the uniform principles in 2019, because they did not include any provisions with regard to chronic toxicity, despite the EFSA guidance in that respect. And it is the chronic toxicity that matters above all to adequately protect bees and pollinators, and also sublethal and cocktail effects must be considered more. At the basis of this conflict, there is a disagreement of the specific protection goal, which means what colony size reduction is acceptable or not. And Commission now suggests that we should accept to move from 7% as referred to in the EFSA B guidance from 2013 to 10% as a starting point, pointing above all to practicality reasons for changing the protection level. I'm a bit concerned about this approach to make the protection level depend on practicality of assessing the reference here. I believe one should first set a level of protection and then find the tools how to assess it and not make the level of protection depend on the tools. And even more important, the issue of the protection of pollinators should not stop at looking at honeybees, because wild bees, bumblebees, solitary bees provide key pollination services, and they're more efficient in pollination than honeybees. Several crops, such as clover or strawberries, are largely depending on wild pollinators. And therefore, I'm looking forward to hear what the representative of ECHA will tell us on this issue today, and likewise, it would be interesting to learn how ECHA and EFSA assess the increasing number of studies that show the detrimental consequences of sublethal effects, which are not sufficiently ex examined in the current le legislation. Should they explain what is a sublethal effect if the bee does not die from the substance? The immune system or the memory might be impaired, leading to further um, deterioration of the, the whole um, the whole beehive, but or or the solitary bee. Um, and I know this is not within the scope of today's event, but I really would like to mention it. When it comes to the evaluation of plant protection products, the effects on amphibians and reptiles are neglected. And this is due to a simplistic assumption that the active substance would never find their way into the aquatic ecosystem and vice versa, amphibians would never leave their aquatic surroundings. Probably quite a few people in the audience can testify that the latter is not the case, whereas we have sound evidence that also the former is untrue, with numerous measurements of pesticide concentrations in surface water. 
Also, adsorption and desorption are always measured in standard soil samples, but this ignores important aspects of the availability of the substance in soil. For example, plant activity can change the adsorption properties and abiotic and biotic degradation of the active substance will, of course, inevitably lead to desorption of the formerly immobilized fraction. And therefore, the approach that adsorbed substances are somehow immobilized forever should be revised. So after issuing the B guidance document, we are coming close to 10 years now without a proper sp specific protection goal because the majority of the member states obviously does not want to protect bees. The European Court of Auditors has stated in his report last year, protection of wild pollinators in the EU, that there are still large gaps in key EU policies addressing the main threats to wild pollinators and that the Pollinators Initiative lacks tools and mechanisms to address these gaps. Last but not least, we are facing a massive decline in insect populations worldwide. This correlates with the use of ever more effective pesticides on ever more land. The most damaging pesticides are forbidden in the EU with good reason, but we still export them to a large number of countries. If we want to take the Green Deal and the protection of pollinators seriously, we should not stop at our borders. In the light of the Green Deal and the biodiversity strategy, we should finally act for the survival of the pollinators, which are indispensable for a large part of our food production. I'm looking forward to discuss with you today how we can advance environmental risk assessment to better protect insect pollinators. Thank you for your interest this morning. Back to Steve, who will introduce our distinguished speakers. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Utah, thank you. Um, give uh, plenty of uh, uh, content there for people to think about. Uh, before we start, I want to briefly outline how we'll proceed. We have four presentations, each followed by 10 minutes of uh, questions and answers. Thanks to all of you who sent questions when registering. Uh, we, re we received over 50 questions and some will be addressed by our speakers during their presentations. Time is limited, but we would like to ensure that the various sectors that you all represent all have a chance to put a question. Could you please submit your question in the chat with your name and your name of your organization or affiliation or company? We're not going to be able to answer all questions today, but we will respond in writing to the relevant questions left unanswered in a document we will also publish. And so to the presentations. So first in line is our EFSA Senior Scientific Officer, Agnès Rorter, who will speak on advancing environmental risk assessment to better protect insect pollinators. Agnès, please, over to you. Thank you very much. So thank you, Steve. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. With this presentation, I will provide you an overview on the finalization of the EFSA project must be which is a holistic and integrated approach uh, for the risk assessment of multiple stresses in honeybees. And towards the end of my presentation, I will also give you a flavor on the next steps at EFSA on insect pollinators. On the first day of the pollinator week, Professor Joseph Settle provided an exhaustive and complete overview on the current status of pollinators declines. And I can only re-emphasize the importance of pollinators and mostly bees in ensuring the health of our environment and the sustainability of our food system and well-being through pollination. But these benefits are threatened by global insect pollinator declines worldwide. In their environment, bees are affected by various stresses and factors modulating their effects. So we have the biological agents, such as infectious agents, pests, invasive species, the chemicals, for example, pesticides, fertilizers, biocides, and contaminants. And there are also several factors modulating the above stresses, for example, climate change, habitat fragmentation, decreasing habitat quality and quantity, and also the specific bee responses to the stresses 
in relation to their ecology behavior and sensitivity. Agricultural landscapes, as you can see on the photo, can be complex and changing over time. And as a result, bees might be exposed to multiple chemicals. This is mostly linked to the farming practices using several chemicals at a time or over time on crops and to the foraging behavior of the bees covering several crops per time unit. However, the potential interactions between different stresses and their possible combined effects are not currently considered by the current regulatory framework. Therefore, to better take into account the complexity of the environment and the exposure of bees, it appears that a paradigm shift is needed. This shift is also in line with the EU Green Deal plan for actions for addressing combined effects from multiple pollutants and for reducing the use of chemical pesticides. Advancing the environmental risk assessment of multiple stresses in bees is the objective of the EFSA must be project, which developed a holistic and integrated approach. The project started in 2015 and was later supported by the European Parliament, who tasked EFSA to develop a scientific opinion for a risk assessment methodology that accounts for multiple stresses and also for a guidance to stakeholders to collect and share harmonized data on bee health for evidence-based risk assessment. To achieve this, the most working group put forward a systems-based approach which comprises a modeling and a monitoring system. They are linked by a multi-directional flow of data and information and also by substantial stakeholders involvement. The modeling component is the APISRA model that simulates the complex dynamic of a honeybee colony in changing landscapes and it can, it can simulate acute and sublateral effects from either single or multiple chemicals in interaction with other stresses. The model will be calibrated and validated by data collect, collected from various regions of Europe. The monitoring component is represented by a network of sentinel hives placed across representative climatic zones and landscapes in Europe. The hives will be equipped with digital sensors for harmonized data collection and storage and analysis on a platform linked to the network. The system-based approach can be used as a predictive tool to estimate risks from new products to be put on the market and the monitoring of the hives and their environment to validate the predicted risks of the product after it is released in the environment. In that way, the approach allows a more realistic risk assessment. Once it is established, the system-based approach will provide benefits to multiple stakeholders. For beekeepers who could use the colonies as an early warning system, providing alerts to new and emerging colony stresses, for farmers to ensure the quality of their good farming practices in relation to the health status of the bees, present in the surroundings, for scientists to access high quality data and address key scientific questions, including an improved understanding of the relative importance of different stresses on honeybee colony health. For risk assessors, the approach will allow them to evaluate the impact of single or multiple pesticides in the context of all the stresses that are faced by honeybee colonies. This is a substantial departure from the current one substance, one assessment approach. Risk managers who could critically evaluate the full range of risk mitigation measures, including integrated pest management linked to site specific assessments in relation to local agricultural landscapes. As a consequence, risk mitigation strategies could be tailored to local contexts facilitating linkages across multiple EU regulatory frameworks relating to pesticides, agriculture and the environment. The proposed approach could also be used as an exploratory tool to inform the setting of protection goals. Finally, for citizens, 
to gain trust and have a better awareness and understanding of pollinators' declines. These benefits also link through to the EUB partnership initiative, which gathers stakeholders from the different relevant uh, sectors, so beekeepers, farmers, NGOs, industry, practitioners, associations, and academia. The initiative started at Bee Week in 2017 with encouragement from members of the European Parliament. It is driven by stakeholders and supported by EFSA. The partnership focuses on the collection and management of harmonized data on bees for the benefit of all. In 2021, EFSA outsourced the development of a prototype platform for the purpose of the EUB partnership. And you will hear more about this in the next presentation by Dr. Noah Simon. The next steps at EFSA covers these four points, but I will only present the last two, so the model APISRAM and the new activities at EFSA on insect pollinators, as the first two items, the guidance revision and the platform will be presented by the next speakers. For APISRAM, the first version requested by EFSA will be delivered early next year, but it will take additional years of development before the model can reliably assess effects in bees from exposure to more complex chemical mixtures and also from invasive species like the Asian hornet or the small hive beetle. By 2030, EFSA has the objective to advance the environmental risk assessment for insect pollinators with a focus uh, on chemicals and with the support and collaboration of the European Commission, European agencies and member states. This is to support the different actions and the farm to fork strategy and biodiversity strategy under the EU Green Deal and to address the current challenges and ensure preparedness for future challenges. This work is supported by the Science Studies and Project Identification and Development Office of EFSA that is prioritizing science studies and developing key scientific areas in consultation with our partners, who also help in clarifying the vision, the scope, the objectives and the opportunities. Below, a few other EFSA projects on environmental risk assessment and chemical mixtures that will be considered when developing the project on insect pollinators. For the insect pollinators, six scientific areas were defined and they are on engagement with our partners and stakeholders on the generation of data and the development of methods and tools for insect pollinators on the risk assessment of combined exposure to multiple chemicals at the population and landscape levels. And finally, on the development and implementation of the system based approaches that you heard about. There is currently a call for tenders to help EFSA in defining a roadmap of actions on this topic, and you can find more information on the link below. I want to thank all the people involved in the project, in particular the MUSB Working Group members and my colleagues at EFSA. Last but not least, there is still time to register until tomorrow to the One Health Conference planned next June, where there will be a session on towards a system-based approach for the environmental risk assessment of pesticides. And with that last slide, I want to thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Agnes. Um, and you managed to deliver your presentation within your 10 minutes, which is great. So that gives us time for us now to take uh, questions. Um, participants, if you have any questions for Agnes, could you put them in the chat and we will, uh, and I will uh, deliver them to her. Um, but I will start off with a question that we were sent during the registration. And it's from the uh, Martin Luther Universität uh, Halle Wittenberg. And uh, they're asking, uh, and yes, uh, microplastics are everywhere. Do they pose a risk to bees and other insect pollinators? Thank you, Steve. I think this is a, a very uh, highly relevant question. Of course, uh, microplastics are everywhere in our environment. And uh, this 
this is a real issue. However, there is no uh, currently any regulation on, on these um, uh, contaminants, uh, plastics. And um, uh, EFSA worked on the, pro on, the, on the topic a while ago and issued a, a statement. And um, it is clear that they, there is a lack of data uh, on uh, the effect of microplastics uh, in the environment. So the, the, the work that EFSA delivered was focused uh, on, on seafood because uh, we could find some microplastic in seafood, so not on honeybees. However, uh, from the literature, it seems that, uh, yes, there are some studies uh, showing some possible uh, interaction with the microbiome of, um, of, um, of uh, honeybees and, and bees in general. So it's, uh, there is a possibility that the microplastic uh, um, increase the sensitivity and the infection level of the honeybees uh, to viral infection. So, so this is one thing. However, I think uh, there, there is still a need to really uh, standardize our analytical methods um, to better determine, you know, uh, the, the, the microplastic, but also uh, more research on the different uh, size, uh, shape of the microplastic, how they impact uh, our pollinators. And um, yeah, this is something that is uh, highly relevant and that uh, we should uh, include uh, in our risk assessment. I also want to take this opportunity to mention that at EFSA, uh, we are also currently working on a project uh, on the um, uh, on the microbiome because this is uh, something that is also very relevant and that uh, could be uh, included in the risk assessment and the quality of the microbiome uh, on, on human but also animal uh, health. And this is something uh, that uh, there will be a case study on bees as well. So something to follow up. And I know also that uh, uh, through the age 2020 uh, scheme, so the, the EU funded projects, um, there is a project called Microbiome uh, that is also working on, on this uh, topic. And uh, in senior, I think they are also looking at uh, developing uh, methods uh, to better measure uh, plastic in the environment. So something to keep on, uh, to keep an eye on. Uh, thanks very much, Agnes. Um, the, we have a question in the chat um, from uh, Carlos Yorquera from a company called Stuff It, uh, who says he's wondering if Apisram can be used for acute and chronic risk assessment, and when will it be required for authorizations of uh, uh, PPP, plant protection products? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Steve, and uh, thank you, Carlos Yorquera. Uh, to ask this question. So in my slide presenting on the delivery of uh, APISRAM in time, um, there was the timeline of 2025 uh, when it will be uh, possible to incorporate more complex uh, chemical mixtures. But also hopefully by this time, uh, we hope that it can be considered uh, by uh, risk managers uh, to, be, uh, to be implemented um, in our risk assessment. But this is up to the risk managers to decide when uh, the model is ready by 2025 on how to include it. And yes, uh, the model can incorporate uh, the, the acute and chronic uh, risk assessment board, but also sublethal, as I mentioned. There will be also uh, some uh, endpoints, um, so the, the egg laying of queens, the uh, hypopharyngeal glands, which are the glands that uh, uh, workers use to feed the brood and also the homing behavior, so the for foraging behavior, will be uh, included in the model as endpoint to measure uh, sublethal effects. Okay, thank you very much, Agnes. Um, uh, another question has come uh, uh, through the uh, registrations, and it's from the UK National Farmers Union, and uh, they're asking what indicators are available to measure and demonstrate how advancing environmental risk assessment for bees and other insect pollinators is achieving its objectives for pollinator populations? I think uh, this is something a little bit uh, early to say because uh, in my last uh, slides, I presented this uh, project on uh, insect pollinators that we are just uh, initiating at EFSA. 
So we need to get uh, data. There is also, before we can uh, really see the effectiveness uh, on the, the project as a whole, there is also the ongoing EU um, pollinator initiative from the European Commission. And I think uh, we need uh, time to gather data and, and see the, the effect on the environment. So this is in work progress. Thanks very much, Agnes. Um, it's nice that you're keeping your uh, answers uh, uh, brief so that we can get as many questions in as possible. We have another one in from the chat, um, and this is from Kelly Papavalu, a uh, freelance ecology consultant uh, from Greece, who says uh, she noted uh, correct. Uh, sorry, she's saying she noticed that the literature source regarding declines in poll pollinators is from 2010. Are there any recent published data from Europe at a large scale and not just local case studies? Yeah, yeah, sure. No, the, this is why uh, as an introdu introduction, you know, I was not, um, I, I didn't mean to be exhaustive and to be full uh, on my literature review. I, I uh, referred to Joseph Settle, who provided an excellent presentation on the first day on this. So uh, there will be uh, I think uh, access to the PowerPoint uh, provided during the pollinator week. So you can have uh, all the literature, the most recent literature, but also uh, the, the ongoing large projects uh, looking at uh, these uh, these things. And there will be more to come in the coming months. OK, thanks, Agnes. Uh, again, uh, uh, we have a question in the chat. This is from Stan Yass, a professional beekeeper in Finland, Copacajeca. Um, uh, uh, directing his attention is Apisram. He says, however, it may be useful, it cannot capture all the diversity in our beehives and apiaries within a single beekeeping, beekeeping operation, region, country, or the whole EU. Uh, he's suggesting that uh, you should work together with the manufacturers of beekeeping equipment and modern digital solutions such as hive scales. We use them more and more, he says. Uh, we also have to be able to share our data in the same format. Um, so that might be also relevant for the next uh, presentation, mm. but maybe you can address some of that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that's <clears throat> something that uh, we need to bring uh, further on the on, uh, around the table for discussion. So when um, you know the, the Aarhus University, who is the contractor developing the model Apisram. We'll have finalized uh, their job in January. I mean, finalized regarding to the specifications uh, provided by EFSA. Uh, there will be uh, time to bring the model to uh, to the experts, so the beekeepers, the farmers, but also scientists, uh, to really look at uh, how valid the model is against uh, the different uh, regions in Europe, against the different scenarios, climatic scenarios, against the different beekeeping management practices. By the way, um, this is something that we are incorporating into the model. So there will be uh, this module on beekeeping management practices that is included in uh, in the prediction of the of the model. So that's something that we are aware of and that uh, uh, yes, we'll need a further discussion with the specialist uh, to make sure that the model um, predicts and reacts uh, accordingly to the reality. Thank you, and yes, I think we might have and time for the, for the Sorry. Just for the dig digital tools, I think it's also a very valid question. And, uh, you know, in the process of um, uh, calibrating and validating the model, we have launched a very large uh, data collection in Denmark and Portugal. So two uh, representative zones across Europe, North and South. And in that process, we used the digital tools. And uh, it's true that uh, we need to make sure that, uh, you know, they, they respond in, in a way that is it is standardized. And this is work progress under Be Good, the H20 project that is also a, a fine tuning uh, methodology on computer based uh, um, IT tools. Thanks, Agnes. I think we have time. We might be able to squeeze two more questions in. Um, another one from the chat from Jaime Perez Parinos from the Centro de Investigaciones Biológicas in Spain. She's saying, when evaluating an insecticide, the honeybee is usually used as a model species. How important is information on possible effects on other bees or pollinators nowadays? 
So this is something that I think Alessio will uh, also uh, explain in, in the revision of the big guidance, because this is a topic that uh, is really related to risk assessment. So there are uh, ways of, uh, you know, making sure that it is also representative for the wild bees. And uh, I think I will leave the floor to Alessio uh, when it comes to his presentation to answer this question. However, I want to just say that the model is not for wild bees, it's just for honeybees, Apisram, and that there will be uh, other models uh, developed uh, in the coming months very rapidly. So uh, under the Bee Good, but also under the Posh Bee uh, Project H2020 on bumblebees and solitary bees to represent uh, these uh, bees as well. Just one. So also something to follow up and the projects will finalize 2023. Thanks, and yes. And then just one uh, final one that we can squeeze in. This is from Marta Tomaselli at the European Commission. She says, how can citizens in their everyday life contribute to improving the life of pollinators? This is a, a very good question. I think they, they are already contributing through the EU Pollinator Initiative. Uh, they are a citizen uh, science uh, initiative there. But I also think that, uh, you know, if uh, we put incentives to really promote biodiversity friendly uh, food production, lowering meat uh, consumption, but also reducing food waste, for example. So there are some kind of uh, approaches like this to really uh, to, to favor the environment and, and protect better our pollinators. So, yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much, Agnes. Uh, we appreciate uh, all the insights you've given us there. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you. And now uh, to our second presentation. And thank you uh, for everybody's contributions, by the way, uh, in the chat. Uh, so to our second uh, presentation, uh, to Noah Simon Delso, uh, EU Bee Partnership Chair and Scientific Director at Bee Life European Beekeeping Coordination. She will give us the perspectives of the EU Bee Partnership prototype platform for collecting and sharing bee health data. Over to you, Noah. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, for the invitation to, to be able to present you um, what is the, the EU Bee Partnership <coughs> prototype platform uh, for the collection of uh, and sharing of, um, of bee health data. So this is uh, the, the main question is why actually we needed um, such a platform. No? And um, Agnes already said it, and Joseph Settle also said that. Uh, so there is a, a, an ongoing critical situation of, uh, of pollinators, at, not only at European level, at worldwide level. And um, we have also had the, the conclusion that actually um, um, there is a challenge uh, to, to about the data, no? let's say. So uh, we know that there is there are all these tendencies, but there is uh, the, the data that exists about it. It is enormous, really a lot of people everywhere, lots of operation producing uh, data, but this data is uh, extremely fragmented, scattered. Uh, there is a lack of, of, of accessibility to all the data and, and information. Um, re not only related to uh, to, to pollinators, uh, populations, to bees, etc., but also to the stressors that eventually could affect them. And uh, all this uh, fragmentation uh, actually um, avoid or, or hamper efficient decision making and, um, and actions to be taken. So for this reason, uh, we, and uh, the we is the European Bee Partnership, uh, decided to um, launch ourselves into the development of, uh, of such a platform. So uh, the European Bee Partnership just, um, well, uh, Agnes already introduced it, but I just would like to say, uh, brings together stakeholders uh, related to, to pollinators. So here you have all the logos. And um, even if we have some uh, members, let's say like full members of the of the partnership and some observers, uh, when we are around the table, uh, we are really um, contributing as uh, as equals, let's say. So around the table, we have uh, the European, uh, so let's say the um, Europe, European, even worldwide uh, beekeeper or uh, beekeeper organizations representatives, the honey packers, the EFSA, uh, the representatives of uh, the sugar beet producers. Uh, Pesticide Action Network as environmental NGO, uh, 
uh, Crop Life as industry um, representative, IBMA as representatives of alternative uh, plant cont um, pest control, and uh, researchers uh, like the European Network of uh, Scientists for Social and Environmental Responsibility, COLOS, and the B Group uh, and the B Goods uh, Project. And then next to it, we have European uh, agencies and, and institutions like the Commission, the Parliament, uh, the uh, IMA, uh, European Environmental um, Agency, GRC, and the European Reference Lab for honey, for uh, bee health. So, as you see, we have, we are all there. Uh, we cover very much uh, horizontally uh, all the, the, at least what we think. Let's say. Uh, all the, the representative stakeholders and institutions. And the, the main objective of everybody, of the, of the group, is to collect data, to standardize data, share this data, and communicate it in order to have a holistic approach uh, to the assessment of uh, the pollinator health. So, um, and then what, so how we are doing that, how we are developing this platform. Now, <laughs> uh, so, I don't know what this is happening, but anyway, it will come eventually. Um, so what we are doing is that uh, we started already in uh, 2019, 2020, uh, with the first efforts to, to start creating this platform. Uh, we, as Be Life, let's say, we did it thanks to the, the, our participation into the European, EO, uh, European project, European funded project EOB. Uh, and there we developed the proof of concept. So it was a very basic. We just included a number of uh, different data sets coming from different sources, different types of data, etc. And then last year, um, EFSA invested some resources to further prototyping the platform. And this is what exists today. And uh, in these efforts, the European uh, Bee Partnership members, they have contributed with some data sets and uh, with advisory for the development uh, of the platform. So this platform, it's, um, um, it's actually, a, what it aims to do is to centralize pollinator related data. Uh, to do it into a standard way, because actually you can imagine that with a large amount of people producing data, it is, everyone does it in a different way. So we try to standardize uh, the, all this data uh, so that uh, the data can be eventually put together, analyzed together, processed together, and we can create information that is uh, useful for decision making. And this, we do it on a, uh, an on, on a secure environment in which, uh, uh, of course, there are no data breaches or things like this, and that uh, in where we, we respect the, um, the intellectual property, property of everybody. So the data providers continue being the owners of the data, and they just share uh, the data with the platform. So we, in the platform, we cannot do anything with this data that the owners uh, do not allow us to do. And this is also done, um, as I said, it is very important, the part of uh, standardization. And for this, we are working with the, um, the BXML uh, group. The BXML group is, um, is an Apimondia working group that is developing uh, standards, uh, data standardizations for, that, for communication. And uh, every, th every time that there is um, Advances, let's say, in the standardization, uh, standard, uh, the standardizations of uh, of some parameters, etc. We automatically integrate them into the platform. So the platform, as it is today, looks uh, like uh, this. Um, so you can, all of you, <laughs> go and visit the platform. Uh, you can become data providers, of course. <clears throat> there are, in, you will find interactive maps, uh, interactive graphs. Uh, lots of information about the data that is collected so far, but I just uh, I just would like to say that this is a work in progress. Okay, it is just a prototype uh, platform, so it still requires improvement. So don't get frustrated if, for whatever reason, something doesn't really work as it should. So yeah, you can also find some interactive graphs if it wants to show. And as I said. The platform, it is just a, an instrument putting together data coming from different sources. So we are giving credit to uh, all the data providers. And uh, this, we, want to, to, we want it to be a win-win relationship. So the, the platform is a, kind of a, a windscreen of, 
any of you or any project that is uh, producing any data uh, related to pollinators and sharing it with the platform. And with this, I had prepared a video <laughs> to show you uh, how the platform is, but I'm actually not sure if I will be able to share it with you, uh, which is very frustrating. Noah, can I um, just say that um, what we could do, we could maybe start a queue uh, the questions and answers. And if you and if the video manages to come up, we'll interrupt the Q and A to yeah. then uh, show the video because it's a lovely video and it should uh, we should try and get it on if we can. Super. So I okay. stop uh, sharing. Uh... Uh, no, you can leave that there because if the video comes up, at least we know um, then that we can uh, kick off with that uh, and then stop the. Um, stop the uh, Q&A for a while. Super. Is that okay with you? Yeah, yeah. Excellent, okay. So, and was the video the end of your presentation? Yeah, yeah, it was at the very end. Okay, okay, well, um, again, very interesting. And um, I think what's remarkable by this, uh, about this EUB partnership is that um, over the uh, Four years of uh, the many discussions that we've had and uh, interactions that uh, this uh, group of uh, uh, that this group of uh, stakeholders uh, are together. They've remained together. Uh, some of some uh, of the uh, representatives don't always agree with each other, but uh, they've uh, worked uh, together to try and achieve this common goal. And we're nearly there. So really a great achievement on behalf of the stakeholders. And also okay. partly due to your stewardship as well, uh, Noah, which has been um, you know, very helpful indeed. OK, well, I got uh, participants. If you want to ask a question, uh, please uh, put it in the um, in the chat uh, so that Noah can uh, answer them. Um, from the registration uh, uh, questions, I have one here, uh, Noah, from the Institute for European Environmental Policy in Belgium. And um, they're asking, how will EFSA include data information on wild pollinators on its B platform? Will revision of sustainable use of pesticides directive include mention of pollinator conservation? And new, the New Horizon Safeguard Project can, uh, it, sorry, the New Horizon Safeguard Project can offer useful information and access to data sources. Uh, they state. Um, can you respond to that? Yeah. So um, thank you. So about the first one. So how will the EFSA include the data or information on wild pollinators? Um, well, I mean. Uh, I can just say that if the data is available, <laughs> we will integrate it. It is, um, let's say, data on wild pollinators. Uh, it's uh, treated as, let's say, any other data on, uh, for instance, weather data that we also would like to, to integrate or land uh, land um, occupations or land, land use. Um, so if the data is available and it is well documented, because that's actually one of the main problems with, uh, with the data that is produced, that um, when we produce data, we of course produce data for, uh, so it is useful for us, let's say. But we don't think that someone else is going to, to use this data. So, uh, so the data sometimes that is produced, it is not well documented. So uh, typically, for instance, it is uh, we can integrate richness and abundance data of uh, pollinator species um, if they are uh, well located in space and time and if they are available, they can be included, including uh, the measurements metadata. Uh, as I said, we can also integrate uh, any stressors uh, or any other relevant data. Uh, if it is available and if it is well documented and the metadata is there, uh, we can integrate it. And um, I mean, the thing is that so far we have we have started with uh, including honeybee data just because it was more accessible to us. But uh, it was the, the platform was never meant to be only for honeybees. Okay, so I mean, I, I wanted to leave very very clear. Um, that the, the the ambition even of the group was much wider than just the the honeybees. So, and about the the revision of the sustainable use directive, um, if it will include pollinator conservation, I don't know. <laughs> I cannot answer on behalf of the commission. Um, 
but at least in the discussions that uh, we have been taking part as be life uh, as stakeholder so far there is not really a clear a specific mention uh, on pollinator conservation so maybe this uh, can be <laughs> taken on board um, by the commission and about the new horizon safeguard project um, well Indeed, I mean, uh, this is a new project. Uh, it is supposed to create a lot of uh, new data about white pollinators. So, and, and also, yeah, white pollinators. So we, we actually hope that uh, all the data that is produced under this, uh, this project and any other uh, publicly funded projects at different levels, not only at European, but even at, at regional level, uh, will be open and shareable. And actually, I, I would really like to invite uh, the, the, any researcher out there producing data uh, uh, related to pollinators to, to, um, to prepare their data sets in collaboration with us. Because um, we have done it for the MASPI project, as uh, Anya said, and um, it, is, it was, I think, a very fruitful collaboration. The data were never released, so it is not, uh, let's say, so of course they are embargo and they're, uh, after everybody does their publications. But the collaboration with us uh, allows for once the, the data are published so that they are standardized, they are very well documented, that anyone outside of the project can also use them. So I, I would really make an invitation now to, to all, any researcher out there producing data uh, with um, relation of, of pollinators to, to really, um, let's say, contact us and then we will be able to, to really standardize the, the way the, the, the data, are, the data sets, let's say, are, are produced so they can be useful for something else. Great, Noah. Thank you very much. That's a very comprehensive answer. Uh, and also, if uh, anybody wants to put in the chat that they're ready to share data, they can do that too. Uh, it doesn't have to be a question. Uh, is the video um, ready, do you think? Animal pollination is yes. essential for healthy environments and our food security. We need to improve our efforts to preserve pollinating insects. However, the issue is complex and requires a deeper understanding of the problems facing pollinators. We need in-depth analyses to accurately assess the situation in the field and come up with solutions. Collecting field data is increasingly important. National authorities, researchers and citizens are continually providing data on relevant parameters such as bee mortality, intoxications, pests, land use and climate. However, the data often lacks integration and does not give a full picture. The complex pollinator crisis requires a more integrated and collaborative perspective. Instead of non-comparable data sets on parameters relevant to pollinator health, there is a need for aggregation, integration and improved visualisation. The EUB Partnership Prototype Platform meets this urgent need. It is a new collaborative online platform that collects, integrates and visualises pollinator related data from different sources. This revolutionary platform works on three development levels, data acquisition, data integration and data visualisation. Through an interactive map, users can navigate a never before seen collection of data relevant to pollinator health. The platform empowers data providers and other users by giving direct and centralised access to otherwise hard to find data. Users can use the tool to assess and find solutions to risks for pollinators. Join us and help shape the future of the platform. Share your data with us and receive the benefits of the platform's future services. Any potential provider is welcome to participate in the EUBP prototype platform and help build the future of data for the well-being of pollinators. The EUBP platform could transform our ability to understand and manage the risks affecting pollinators. A new community is growing with people coming together to maximise the value of their data for a common objective, a better future for pollinators and for us. That's a, That's a very, nice very nice video. video. Thank you. I'm so grateful it worked. <laughs> it's, it worked, it very, worked well. very well. Yeah. We, um, we have an echo. Is that because no it's gone that's fine um uh, we have uh, just a few minutes uh, left uh, in the q a section um maybe there's one um uh, if i can get my screen to stop scrolling down uh no i can't so okay 
it's not working. So I think uh, we'll leave it there for now, uh, Noah. Uh, we can always come back at the end if we have time. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your uh, presentation, the lovely video, and uh, answering the questions. So thank you. Thank you very much. So back to EFSA now for our third presentation, and uh, which is an overview uh, and the current status of the EFSA B guidance review, given by EFSA scientific officer Alessio Ippolito. Please, Alessio. Yes, thank you, Steve. Give me just a second to work out the logistics. Yes, and thank you, Madam Chair, for letting me uh, for letting me give this this presentation on the current status of the BE guidance document review. Uh, for those in the audience who might not be well acquainted with that, this is the guidance document which is at the basis for the uh, assessment of the risk of pesticides and plant protection products to bees. So I've decided to structure my presentation as a famous Italian movie from the 60s, Yesterday, Today and Tomorrow, where the yesterday part is what have we done so far in the revision, the today is what are we currently working on, and obviously the tomorrow part is how are we planning ahead. Now, as you can see from the color coding of this slide, most of the presentation will be focusing on the yesterday part. This is not by chance, it is because uh, we believe that most of the work has already been done. And in fact, uh, we've done quite, a, quite some work already and it's going to be extremely challenging to present all the things that we have done in less than 10 minutes. So I've decided to just use uh, some highlights, to present some highlights wrapped around a set of keywords, which I believe uh, describe pretty well the objectives that we had when, uh, when starting this review. And the first keyword that I would like to mention is increased accuracy. So there are, of course, several parameters that are used in the risk assessment scheme. Uh, and of course, it, it is very important to have reliable estimations of those. Uh, therefore, we chose to have a, a, to adopt a very uh, to adopt very systematic approaches, some of which are summarized in this slide. Uh, for example, we've performed several systematic literature reviews. These are uh, comprehensive analyses that entail considering all the scientific literature which has been published on a specific topic. And as you can see, we've had three systematic literature review before. That lets us to consider several thousands of scientific papers and let us to extract several thousand of individual measurement for, let's say, having a good estimation of the parameters that are used in the risk assessment scheme. For some parameters, the information in the literature is, is a bit more scarce, uh, but it's, it's very much present, for example, in pesticide dossier. So that's the basis we've used, for example, for estimating pesticide residues. We've considered more than 150 residue trials and 70 dissipation studies. Uh, the second keyword is more fit for purpose. We want to give risk manager with this uh, guidance document, we want to have a good description of the risk which is relevant for the EU agroecosystem. So this is why we have revised some aspect of the exposure scenarios, such as the relevance of the weed scenario and the reanalysis of the crop attractiveness. The first one was mainly performed through analysis of uh, efficacy trials, the control of the efficacy trial for herbicides. Uh, while for the second one, I'd like to, to slow down for a moment because I, I believe uh, the second one is the definition of the crop attractiveness. I would like to slow down for a moment because uh, I think this is a very good example to show that we did not stop to the existing literature, but we also try to produce new knowledge or at least uh, to formalize existing knowledge. Uh, information on crop attractiveness is indeed quite scattered in the literature. So we try to drill the knowledge from a panel of experts, panel of B experts, using a process which is called expert knowledge elicitation, which is also very systematic and allow to report the existing but previously unsystematized, unreported knowledge together with a quantitative description of the related uncertainty. We did not, of course, limit ourselves to the exposure only. We also wanted to have a better look 
of the dose response relationship that exists when bees are exposed to pesticides. So we consider more than 600 ecotoxicity studies in order to describe better uh, this relationship compared to what was done in the past. And in the context of assisting the risk manager and providing a valuable input to the risk manager, we also offer our support for the definition of the specific protection goal for honeybees, which by the way, was agreed during the last summer. For this specific, uh, this specific part, we offer an analysis of the uh, background variability of honeybee colony size, which was based on both experimental data and uh, modeling information. The third keyword is a better consideration of bee diversity. Now, the aim of the guidance document is not just to assess the risk to honeybees, but also to bumblebees and solitary bees. As it has already been clarified during this session, the problem is that for wild bees, uh, the information that is available is considerably more scattered. There are many, many bee species which are considerably understudied. And also the substance specific data that we will receive in the future, let's say in, uh, in dossier submission, will still very much be focused on honeybees as this is the legislative requirement. However, we have collected uh, the limited information that are available on, on bumblebees and solitary bees, and that helped us to establish relationship between basic biological traits, such for example, as the bee size, to several important parameters that are used in the risk assessment. So for example, we're now in a position to have a better estimate of sugar consumption for many different bee species, a better estimate of contact exposure for many different bee species. So this is for the exposure part, but also we are in a better position to predict the difference in sensitivity. And that was done considering a lot of uh, ecotoxicity studies on a restricted number of species, but that allow us to establish a relationship with bee size, which is going to be useful for the risk assessment and such. So this is, let's say, what we have done. We still acknowledge that uh, most of the data will still be on honeybees, and uh, we are now able to consider bee biodiver diversity in a better way than the past, but new scientific developments are absolutely needed on this topic. The fourth keyword that I would like to mention is to have extended collaboration. We had two main objects here. Uh, first of all, to check periodically with the stakeholder that what we are doing is well understood so that we can get uh, useful feedback from them. And in fact, we had three consultations with stakeholders and member states, and also two info sessions with stakeholders and member states, and we're planning more for the future. We also had three consultations with the risk manager on the specific protection goal. And then the second main object was to bring on board as much scientific and technical expertise as possible. So we had continuous cross fertilization with one ACA working group. You will hear immediately after my presentation. And also other two EFSA working group. You just heard from Agnes one of them, but there was another one which was, uh, let's say, involved in this discussion. We had an external expert panel working on attractiveness. We had several contractors working on specific issues. These are uh, be expert or risk assessment expert working on specific topics. And also we had several earring expert modelers, agronomists intervening in our working group. This is it for, let's say, the part that we've already done. So what are we currently working on? Uh, as you might be aware, the risk manager recently provided an input about what is the specific protection goal to be used for honeybees. So we're now revising the entire risk assessment scheme to make it compliant with such a specific protection goal. And for the first time, we're also working for integrating the assessments of different route of exposure in different time scales. So bees can get exposed in several different ways and over different time periods. And uh, these assessments were normally kept separate in the past. We are now trying to integrate that to really provide uh, an effect at the colony level of all these, uh, these aspects. We are, of course, revising also the requirement for higher tier studies, and this is, for example, field studies. And we're working on other topics like sublethal effects, which is particularly challenging, and better consideration of long-term low exposure. So what are we planning ahead for the future? We've recently received a letter from Sante asking for support for setting the SPG for wild bees. So we are now gathering all the evidence that we can in order to draft the third supporting document in this sense. And once a decision is made by the risk manager on the SPG for wild bees, we will implement that in the risk assessment as well. 
Of course, the draft guidance document will undergo a public consultation phase, so we will consider all the comments and we will amend the guidance document if that is needed. And another very important part of the work that we, I believe it's do, we are doing is that we will con collate all the knowledge gaps that are still present, and we hope that these will help steer future research activity to fill those gaps. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention, and I will join the, the plea from Agnes to register for the ONE conference in June 2022. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alessio. Um, as you'd expect, we have one or two uh, more questions uh, than uh, with the others. Uh, we'll kick off with one from our chair. Uh, Ms. Paulus asks, um, could you briefly explain what's behind the WEED scenario? Uh, yes, of course, I can, I can try to explain. Of course, uh, as, as many other activities that was done with, by, the, by the working group is a rather complex activity, but one of the things that was a uh, challenge in the EFSA B guidance document was this weed scenario, which is when the bees get exposed in the field from contaminated pollen and nectar of the weeds. So one of the criticisms is that when you grow a crop for some specific crops, you don't really have flowering weeds in the crop to a considerable amount. So what we have done is to consider efficacy trials, uh, control the control part where no chemicals are used. So only the crop is left, let's say, uh, left grow on its own uh, and to check whether these flowering weeds are actually present in a considerable amount of no or not. So we reanalyze more than 7,000, 7, I think, efficacy trials to, to check whether that scenario was relevant for those specific crops and those specific uh, growth stages of the crop. So that, that was used, let's say, for revising the, the scenario as such. It doesn't mean that the wheat scenario is not longer there, it's still there. Uh, it's just that the, for some situations and some specific situation, we've, we've really reassessed whether, that's, whether that scenario is relevant or not. Okay, thank you, Alessio. Um, we have another question in the chat from a journalist, from uh, Robert Hodgson, who's with ENDS Europe, a uh, journalist in Brussels. He asks, the Commission stated that the specific protection goals needed to be measurable in reference tier, i.e. field studies. Have you made a proposal for field studies that can meet the new Honeybee 10% SPG? Thank you. Thank you for your question. So, as I hope that was, uh, I hope that was uh, somehow included in the presentation. Perhaps I was not clear enough. Uh, we've recently received the uh, the protection goal from from the risk manager. So for honeybees, that's ten percent on uh, on colony strength. We are currently working on to adjust the requirement for field studies in order to make them compliant with the with the SPG with the detection of the effect included in the SPG. So that's something that we are currently working on and that is something for which for sure we will make a proposal in the in the revised guidance document. Okay, thanks Alessio. I misrepresented uh, Mr. Hodgson. That wasn't his question. It was a question from an unknown user. Um, so now I will put Mr. Hodgson's question to you. Uh, apologies, uh, Mr. Hodgson. So his question is, to what extent has EFSA taken into account possible effects of exposure to mixtures of chemicals, the cocktail effect as it's commonly known as, during its work on the guidance document and how? Thanks. Thank you. So that that is of course a very relevant question and i thank who will, whoever posed this question because i think that, that helped me uh, clarify a bit this this, this issue so we, we have to realize that the efsa guidance document is within a specific legislative framework huh? so it, it cannot address all the scientific topics that are related to pesticide exposure to bees Mixer toxicity is addressed in the guidance document as much as what is called tank mixture. So whenever you have formulations that are used and that include several active ingredients at the same time, that is addressed in the, in the guidance document. What, what we cannot address from a legislative point of view is the mixture in the sense of many different substances and many different formulations being applied 
on the same crop on different times. That is something which is not in the in the current framework of the legislation and therefore uh, it is not the focus of the guidance document revision. OK, thank you, Alessio. Uh, could I just uh, ask uh, participants if you put a question in, could you at least put your name uh, and who you are or who you represent? Because that would be um, quite useful. Um, so we have another from Stan Haas from Finland. Um, he says uh, beekeepers, uh, their honeybees as well as farmers and their crops are increasingly challenged by climate change and its effects on food resources for pollinators. Do you factor in the climate change in your risk assessment of uh, plant protection products? That is a very interesting question, in fact, uh, and it's also a very, a very difficult one to answer. Uh, factoring in something as complex of cli as climate change is extremely challenging indeed. We still don't know very much what kinds of consequences climate change have as both on bee behavior, on, on the use of plant protection products, on the distribution of different bee species. So these are very relevant unknowns that we will, of course, acknowledge in the guidance document that, but at the moment, in order to provide something which is, let's say, immediately usable for regulatory purposes, we cannot really factor in. But it is absolutely something that uh, EFSA should be working on. And in general, I would say, research on the topic should be should, should work on to make sure that the risk assessment will be let's say ready when when the consequences of, of climate change which are still already which are already there but uh, not as known when these become a bit more uh, evident let's say okay thank you very much um, we have a question from Syngenta Nordics in Denmark uh, their question is um, uh, this was sent in the registration document. Uh, honeybees are not an endangered species, and yet there has been a larger focus on the development of the risk assessment guidance related to these. Why have you no pr not prioritized the guidance for bumblebees, which should be the ones that should be the focus to ensure biodiversity? Again, thank you for this question, which is again a very relevant one. I'm really thankful for this. Uh, it is true that historically the focus has been on honeybees and this is a very practical reason and I think that was also clarified by the previous speakers. We know honeybees much better than, than we, we know other species so we, we test them quite cleanly also for the effects of pesticides unlike other bees and they, are, they were considered in the past a suitable model species. We are now trying to, bit, to move uh, a bit away from that but the starting point is still the same. We, we still know quite little about other bees, both in terms of their sensitivity and in terms of how much they get exposed to pesticide. So we are in a sort of a transition period, I would say, uh, where we still have to rely on honeybee as a model, but with a much more detailed consideration of the difference, differences among species. And I hope that I convey that from my talk. Uh, anyway, Coming from the question, I can say that also EFSA is also working to produce some of the data that we need to move forward. So, for example, EFSA has recently launched a procurement to collect and to generate new data on non-target arthropods, including wild bees. Uh, so this is this is a quite a big procurement. It's worth one million euro. Uh, so it's not really a small project, and we hope that other public institution in the EU or even elsewhere will follow our example and will be willing to collect more data in this sense. And I think that will be the very starting point so that we can really produce risk assessment schemes that are more also targeted, let's say, to wild species. Thanks, Alessio. Um, we had a question from uh, Ratislav Sabo from the Slovak National Registration Authority, um, but I don't know which of the questions uh, without the name relates to you, um, Ratislav. So, um, I, I'll just hold off for that and maybe you can repost. Uh, in the meantime... No, no, he wanted to know which sublethal effects. Thank you for the presentation, please. Which sublethal effects do you mean? Thank you. That's okay. what I read at 10.06. Okay, thank you very much.
Okay, that that's, uh, thank you for the question. Indeed, I had very, very little time to enter into that. Uh, so subliteral effects are, of course, one of the most challenging part in the revision of the risk assessment. And that is because we, our protection goal is an effect on the colony size. And linking subliteral effect, any subliteral effect, to uh, an effect on the colony size, it is extremely challenging. And even for honeybees that are so well studied, that linkage is not well known at all. Uh, so we are still, as I said, we are still working on, on this part of the guidance document. For sure, we will be considering as a subliteral effect um, foraging behavior, for example, which is which is one of the perhaps most relevant one, which is perhaps the easier to link to, to, a, a, to a colony size reduction. So that, for that, there is already uh, also a test guideline developed by the OECD. So that's something which can be included, uh, let's say, in an easier way into the risk assessment scheme. We still have to consider whether there is the possibility for including other subliteral effects, considering the fact that we need to link that with the specific protection goal. Uh, but more work is, is that, that that is something that we're clearly working on, so which I don't really have let's say, a final answer to give to, to the audience. Thanks, Alessio. We're almost um, up uh, on our time, uh, but I would like to squeeze in a question from Polinis, from uh, Barbara Berardi. Uh, she says, for contact exposure and for solitary bees in particular, did you consider also exposure to soil contamination? And that's our final question, I'm afraid. Thank you. That is also a very relevant question. We know that uh, bumblebees and solitary bee species can, in fact, be exposed uh, to contamination of pesticide in different ways than, than honeybees do. This, this is absolutely a knowledge. Uh, we still lack a lot of knowledge about how this exposure actually happens, so how to really quantify that exposure. And that is one of the main aspects that he was included in the technical specification of the procurement we have just launched. So the, the short answer to this is at the moment, this is not included in the guidance document because of lack of knowledge, but we are already proactively trying to fill that gap, specifically that one for soil, in fact, to know better how wild bees to what extent, in fact, wild bees get exposed to soil contamination, especially when they nest into the soil. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Alessio, uh, and for your very clear uh, answers. Uh, I think I'm sure that's been much appreciated. Um, and uh, as I, re I remind participants, the questions that we weren't able to uh, address, we will in writing um, and in the, within the next uh, two or three weeks. Thank you very much. Alessio, thank you. Um, now uh, we have uh, Simon Gutierrez Alonso of the European Chemicals Agency Biocidal Active Substance Unit, uh, who'll give our final presentation. And this will be an overview and status on the development of a guidance for assessing risks to arthropod pollinators from the use of pesticides, uh, biocides, sorry, biocides. Over to you, Simon. Thank you, Steve. Uh, yeah, that's good that you that you emphasize that it's not pesticides anymore. We move towards uh, biocides now. And uh, if you give me just a minute, I will uh, share my presentation here on the screen. I hope you see it now. <clears throat> so thanks for the uh, for the nice introduction. Thank you, EFSA, and thank you, Chair, for inviting me today to give this talk. Um, I think, as I said before, we move a little bit the focus to a different set of chemicals, and I hope I can give you today an overview of what activities are we involved in and, uh, and what is a bit the future for us looking at this guidance development. So where this started for us in, in ECA and specifically for biocides, we uh, did the first authorization for some uh, insecticides back in, uh, well, let's say uh, around nine or 10 years ago, uh, where we covered the risk to bees, which is a requirement in our uh, regulation by a very simplified uh, methodology, acknowledging that further guidance would be needed. 
So it was back in 2019 where the Commission under the EU pollinator strategy um, prepared a mandate for ECHA to start working and to develop a guidance for assessing the risk to arthropod pollinators, including bees. And that's a that's an interesting difference to the mandate that was submitted to, to EFSA uh, from the use of biocides. And also in the mandate, it was uh, highly uh, specified that we should follow as much as possible uh, EFSA work and we should align and, and uh, collaborate with each other in the development of the, uh, this guidance. Then also as part of the mandate, we should uh, also specify what would be the data requirements for, uh, for industry when preparing their risk assessments uh, for bees and pollinators. So what have we done so far? And I can only talk a little bit on the past and the present. So basically, as this is a new work for us, we started by defining uh, expert groups and that involves um, our member states, uh, experts, and also the stakeholders who have an interest and who have knowledge on the topic. So we spent some time developing these groups. Uh, we're pioneering in ECHA, uh, at least with regards to, to uh, stakeholder uh, consultation groups uh, in this context. So, um, so it took a little bit of time. And then what we did uh, was to define the scope of the guidance uh, through, um, through, a, through a document uh, which we call the scoping document which we also published and, uh, and asked our stakeholders and member states to give their opinions on that. After the consultation on the scope, then we started the drafting stage and that's where we are at the moment. And, and as soon as we've compiled all that, then we will uh, finalize the first draft and start then all the consultation period, which is normally, uh, which will follow, uh, let's say our regular um, strategy for, for consultation of guidance in, in ECAP. So to talk to you a little bit of uh, who is the expert group, who's working on this guidance, as I said before, we rely on uh, on the expert knowledge from our member states uh, dealing with biocides. Unfortunately, we uh, that, that's our limitation. They act on a voluntary basis uh, for the development of this guidance. And as you can see in the map, it, there is a there is an interesting distribution of member states across Europe. And it's also important to mention EFSA, and I think uh, Alessio has mentioned it again. We are closely collaborating with each other, participating in our expert group meetings and uh, cross um, cross fertilizing our uh, both of uh, both guidances with the knowledge and the methodologies that are being generated. Then, as I said before, we generated the group of stakeholders and, and important there to mention is that in, for, for the development of this guidance, we included industry, academia and NGOs. And we, we thought, uh, we still think we have a good representation of, of stakeholders. So what are biocides and why are they different to, to pesticides? And why do we need to change a bit the, the, the way we look at this? Uh, in the biocides framework, we have 22 product types which reflect the variety of different active substances and modes of application of biocidal products and the way they enter into the environment. And the reason why um, we thought this is important to mention is because we need to filter out, we need to concentrate our effort in, in the substances and the type of uses that matter. So we need to generate a strategy that makes sense and, and which is realistic and, uh, and achievable in the short term, at least. So what we developed and we put in place already at the scoping time was a draft strategy. How are we going to look at the products? How can we filter out and concentrate in the substances and uses that matter and and make sure we we give a high level of protection for the pollinators so first of all we we would look at the substances which are meant as an insecticide a caricide or so product to control our arthropods and for those we will ensure there is a risk methodology in place the data will be generated by industry to cover the necessary information uh, gaps but then we have another set of other actives and other products uh, where the mode of action or the intention of the substance is not so clear or not so uh, insect related. And therefore, the first screening approach we would do is can we assess whether the exposure is relevant for, uh, for pollinators? If yes, then we would continue to the next step, which is analyzing a bit the mode of action and understanding whether there is a real concern or whether we have sufficient knowledge to um, to understand their mode of action and the, and the relevance towards pollinators. 
why do we bring these blocks in place? Because again, from a buyer side point of view, we have actives such as, for example, ozone or, uh, for example, uh, acetic acid uh, substances, which we know they would be of uh, less concern than, for example, the aquatic environment or other compartments, which will uh, probably be protective enough uh, if compared to, to insects and especially uh, pollinators. So what is uh, important also to mention, the protection goals, um, how to deal with that from a biocidal point of view. It's been also over the summer agreed by our risk managers and our competent authorities that we will follow whatever is decided from plant protection products for uh, with regards to SPGs. And that also, um, let's say, set, set a good basis for us because then we don't need to reinitiate the discussion. It will improve consistency between the, the different regulatory frameworks and I think it would help everybody and the outside world to understand um, the, the, the way the assessments are done. And we'll also try to follow the most of the principles set out in the EFSA guidance, but with some adaptations. And of course, I put here on the screen, uh, let's say, the, the, the basis for the, for the EFSA guidance and most of our risk assessment uh, guidance is where they start from a screening step towards a higher tier study where you have complex field and semi-field studies. I think here it's worth mentioning that for biocides, we will mostly need to leave it at screening or first tiers because most of the field and semi-field studies are designed for plant protection applications. And it would be a little bit, um, it, it would be very difficult to, to read from those studies and try to apply the study setting for, for biocide application. So where are we working? Uh, you see here in the screen on the blue, uh, on the top uh, side, the exposure related uh, open open items that we're working on. And then on the lower on the lower uh, side, you've got the uh, the effect related um, open open items. We're working in most of them. We're, we're trying to close uh, and finalize as much as possible issues that are biocides related, uh, where we can, let's say, work a little bit aside from, from uh, EFSA and concentrate and understanding a little bit better the type of use, the ways of exposure and things like that, and uh, leaving still some blocks for EFSA to develop. So we are a little bit learning from them, um, trying to get as much as possible from, from those developments. So some areas we are still uh, pending. On, on some advan advan advancements and some agreements at the EFSA side. So just I, I, I will highlight a bit uh, a few a few issues that may be of interest of you for you. So exposure ba uh, exposure we are basing our emission estimations as much as possible in the EFSA scenarios and mostly we're focusing in 2013 guidance and we will have to make the corrections once the new uh, knowledge comes in. But basically, we're looking at three main types of, uh, of exposure for biocides. We're looking at overspray, and those are biocides which are used uh, to be sprayed in, in the forest or in recreational areas to protect humans against uh, certain insects or certain plaques. Uh, we're looking at the manure and the sludge as a way, as a vehicle for uh, certain biocides to enter the environment. And those are, for example, insects, insecticides used in stables, which are then uh, gathered through the manure and then spread on the field. Or we also have biocidal products which are applied directly into the manure. And then we have another interesting set of, of products, which are baits and other small scale uh, applications of uh, certain insecticides, which we're still trying to generate knowledge and trying to generate a better understanding. Also, there is an area where industry is developing quite fast and it's not necessarily easy to understand uh, the scale, the uh, let's say the, the, the factor of, of attractants used in baits, how they how the pollinators react to that how much are they exposed and, and all these elements that we still need to define. And then, of course, risk mitigation measures. Can we build some risk mitigation measures uh, which are substantiated by scientific elements that can help us then uh, in the risk assessments? 
In regards to the mode of action, I just wanted to give you a, a kind of a flavor of what we're looking at uh, here. As I said before, we want to disregard and be able to focus on what matters uh, and be able to be a bit more um, more protective and, and identify those substances that really matter in the biocides um, area. And here we set up a, a weight of evidence a type of a strategy where we gather lines of evidence from, uh, from, for example, literature, from read across from similar substances, from certain QSARs, from data that has been generated in other compartments in order to be able to, to assess whether the substance would be of high concern or of lower concern. And of course, giving also the option to kind of uh, skip the, the, uh, the weight of evidence or to build it up based on certain acute and chronic studies. So that's an interesting part of the work where we are also using kind of the, the knowledge that has been generated in NECA over the years. So jumping into the non-B pollinators, what we have done with that. Um, so we based or we started our assessment basing on the flower visiting insects concept, which are defined as uh, species that directly interact with flowers, at least in the flying uh, adult life stage. And that served as, as a way to identify the, the species which are relevant in the non-target uh, arthropod pollinators world. There are thousands and thousands of species. So therefore, uh, we, we need to define what is a pollinator and how can we uh, identify those ones which we need to focus on. So what we did um, is a non-exhaustive literature and database review on, uh, on several orders, uh, Lepidoptera, Coleoptera, Diptera, and Hymenoptera. And we collected information on main characteristics and um, habitat types, ecological role and ecological traits, uh, feeding behavior. And then with all that data, we, uh, we selected the species that matter. So those species which, uh, visit, uh, which visit flowers, which consume nectar and pollen, which are geographically relevant for uh, EU context. And then once we selected a, a number of, of interesting species or species of which are relevant, then we embarked ourselves into a sensitivity uh, literature review, where again, as, as Alessio and, and the rest of the presenters today have highlighted, the information is quite scarce and is difficult to collect. But anyway, we collected as much as we could and we made a few comparisons of sensitivity data with the intention to use um, honeybees as a surrogate to protect all the pollinators. And at the end, important to, to highlight and, and perhaps something that can feed on later work by EFSA and by other uh, agencies is identify very clearly what are the data gaps and what can be recommendations for future research. Here I'll show you, I think I'm, I'm running a little bit out of time, but I will give you just a flavor of, of the sensitivity data that we have collected. Here you see a number of compounds and in a red triangle, the honeybee um, uh, endpoint. And in other colors, you see other uh, organisms where we collected some data. And as you can see here, not necessarily honeybee is always the most sensitive species, which of course uh, is, is difficult to conclude on that fact, but gives you kind of some elements to, to understand that there, there are out there uh, species which are more sensitive than, than honeybee. So information and knowledge gap, and this is something that we have uh, fed into EFSA's work uh, to, to put some, some resources now to investigate some of these. I mean, most of it has been mentioned already, vulnerable and relevant, which are the species which are vulnerable and relevant still, uh, we, are, we are getting there, we're getting closer. The database is scarce, as we said before, and not only is it scarce, but the data that you collect is uh, done with tests with different duration types, with different substances being used. So it's very difficult to make those comparisons. So concluding on sensitivity is extremely difficult at this point in time. We can only reflect on some findings. So we need more laboratory studies. We need more studies which reflect uh, or which are done under the, the same um, conditions where we can then extract valuable information in order to uh, to use some speci species as surrogates and, and have a good sensitivity analysis. So with that, I hope I gave you a flavor of what we're doing. Um, I must say that I need to thank all, all the colleagues working on this, especially my, my ECA colleagues working uh, closer to me, 
but also all the rest of the member states who have uh, intensively worked on this um, and are spending um, quite a lot of time in, in this guidance. So I hand back to you, Steve. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, and we still have time for a couple of questions before we begin to wrap up. Um, we have one uh, in the registration which uh, comes from um, ISK Biosciences Europe in Belgium, uh, which says, um, will there be some alignment on data requirements, guidance development for applications under reach, biocides and plant protection products? Uh, related to upcoming guidance, will it be updated with a newly agreed SPG and will it elaborate more on acceptance, study design of tunnel, semi-field and field type studies? I'm not sure that's for you, Simon, is it? <laughs> I, I think I can take the first part. Yeah, take the first part. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll take the first part. And, and uh, yeah, th I think the data requirements is something that we're looking closely uh, together with EFSA. We've uh, we've had a couple of sessions where we, our experts and, and EFSA experts have uh, a bit explained where we are with the data requirements. In general terms, we will follow the same strategy. There may be some uh, slight differences in in uh, in some of the tests that we may require. And that again is probably related to higher tier studies where where biocides do not necessarily fit that well, and and hopefully we have we have alignment in the in the data requirements. Um, as you you've mentioned also reach and I must say reach uh, and and let's say industrial chemicals are still a little bit behind in this uh, issue of protecting uh, bees and other pollinators. So I hope in the next future they will follow, but at the moment it's it's biocides and pesticides on the focus. Thanks very much, uh, Simon. Um, participants, do you have any questions to put in the chat uh, for Simon? No. Okay. Uh, somebody has their hand up. I think this is Noah. I think, isn't it? Noah, do you want to uh, speak? Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, I cannot have access to the chat, so I just leave <laughs> um, Gracias, Simon. I just wanted to ask you one thing. So in the scheme that you have uh, presented uh, regarding uh, when you select if the active substance is going to be relevant or not uh, in terms of toxicity to the, to the bees or the pollinators, uh, <clears throat> what would happen if, for instance, there is, you, can, you do not find any data related to it? So let's say, um, you know, like <clears throat> you cannot have any a priori because there is nothing out there. So what do you do in this case? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, I think it's it's important to mention that when, when no data is there, then you need to generate data. And um, when we develop these schemes, the, the most complex thing is to to show that your substance is not relevant. I mean, to show that it's relevant, then as soon as you have some information, then you're you're able to 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 let's say put it in the priority list. But the most difficult is is when there is no data, how can you say there is no concern? And that's that's why the, the strategy is developed in a way that in the absence of data, then you would need to generate that in order to prove uh, to prove to prove the fact that it's not uh, it's not relevant. I hope that answered your, your question. Thanks, uh, Simon. Um, we probably just have time for one more and appropriately it comes from our chair. Uh, so Ms. Paulus is asking, will you also build on the data and experience of the uh, European uh, Environment Agency? They have a wealth of data concerning monitoring of insects, for example. Yes, thank you, thank you, Chair, for the for the question. Uh, indeed, we've we've started to uh, to run a um, a periodical workshop among uh, agencies and uh, different parts of the Commission. Uh, so we've started to identify a pool of uh, of areas of knowledge and um, and also experts working on different fields. So, uh, so we can in the near future also use the different information that has been generated in the at different fronts. And indeed, there is a lot of information being generated uh, in the EEA, uh, which which will for sure be useful for us uh, now and and in the future. 
Okay, thanks very much, uh, Simon. Um, I think uh, we may just have to wrap up um, and uh, we will answer the questions that you've put and we haven't been able to address. Uh, the time just uh, runs away from us. Um, and uh, yes, if we could have had an extra, an extra hour because uh, there are some questions that we uh, should address, but we will do uh, as we've promised. So thank you, Simon. Uh, and uh, now uh, we come to the, uh, as we draw to the end, uh, I will hand over again to our chair, uh, Jutta Paulus, uh, for any concluding remarks uh, that she uh, wishes to make. Uh, and, uh, and then um, uh, she will hand back to me. Thank you. Um, well, it is a bit difficult to wrap up all this important content in about five minutes. And I think we all have learned a lot about what is going on at the respective agencies at the EFSA and the ECA on the um, much needed research on the reasons for the decline of our pollinators. I was very um, positive. I think the positive note is that we are really going into the collection of data now and that a lot of people are involved through the BHAB platform. And thanks again um, for all those who worked on this. And I think it needs to be broadened into the um, into the society, to the beekeepers, but also to all the people that do, let's call it citizen science, and they need to know how they are to collect the data which they collect. Um, for example, most of the time, at least uh, that's my perception, the people that are being outside um, monitoring insect populations are not being paid for it, but they do it because their heart bleeds for the insects, actually. And I think it's um, very important to convey to them how should they collect the data, how could it be fed into the into the BHUB platform in order to be able to really assess what's going on in our meadows and, and in our fields. Um, Agnes has very well said we need a paradigm shift. We need to get away from those simplistic models where you just look at one substance and one organism and one way of um, contact or um, or at least a single way of, of contact. I mean, we have the oral and the contact um, toxicity, but we're, for example, not um, looking what happens if you only um, have contaminated pollen and not nectar, is there a difference? What difference does it make for the larvae which are fed mainly with pollen, for example? Um, I think what Alessia said about, about the work of EFSA, it's very good to have more collaboration here and more consideration of the differences within the bees. But nevertheless, I was a bit taken aback when you said that you were having um, your you are looking at 15 species of wild bees now for the sensitivity study. And I think there should maybe be more cooperation with the ECHA because um, the slide where the sensitivity was compared for different active substances, at least to me, it seemed that it was a bit more than just 15 species of wild bees. And that we also should look at the, um, at the flies, at the butterflies, at pollinators which are often, often overlooked in our assessment. Um, I bet the list of knowledge gaps is much longer than the list of what we actually know. And uh, this is a real danger because um, everyone is talking about climate change and how we have to do everything to um, bring the emissions down and um, stop putting CO2 in the atmosphere. But we have a solution for that. We have renewable energy. We can do loads of stuff in changing our mobility behavior, in insulating our homes, and um, we can even draw back CO2 from the atmosphere, for example, through nature restoration, which is the most cost-effective way to do so. There was a very interesting webinar yesterday on this. Um, but when it comes to the, the threat of biodiversity loss, Extinction is the most final thing, thing you can do on this planet. You will never be able to bring back a species that um, 
was going extinct. And that is something that we humans have not quite grasped yet. And also, we ha I think we have not quite grasped that this um, mass extinction is threatening our own civilization on this planet. And therefore, I think it's a good step in the right direction to increase our knowledge. But I would um, really like to see a more stringent approach on the precautionary principle saying what we do not know, we should we should count with the worst and not with the best. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madame Paulus. Uh, that's uh, that's great. Uh, lots of uh, uh, lots of things for people to think about, uh, and uh, we should certainly take note of some of the um, uh, issues that you uh, raised there. Uh, and particularly, we need to focus uh, as far as the prototype platform, and I think that's already in people's thoughts uh, about citizen science and how important that is. Uh, and I know that's a rich vein to uh, to to, to uh, pursue. We've come to the end uh, of uh, our session. Thank you very much to all the participants for attending. Um, thank you, speakers. And uh, that's it. So from Palmer in Italy, from Helsinki and from Brussels, it's goodbye. Goodbye. Bye, thank you. Bye bye, thank you everybody.